Uh, however, he was uh, uh, being spiritually inclined. He joined the Ramakrishna uh, Math as a renunciate upon being impressed by the life and work of the Vedantic philosopher Ramakrishna Paramahams. His initial name was Brahmachari Brahma Chaitanya. He was renamed as Sami Vidyanathananda after receiving his saffron robe in 2008. Swami Vidyanathananda is a monk at the Order's headquarters in Belur Mart. He was professor of mathematics and dean of research at, at the Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda University till 2015. He is currently a professor of mathematics at the Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. He has widely published and presented his research in the area of hyperbolic manifolds and ending lamination spaces. His most notable work is the proof of existence of Canon Thurston maps. This led to the resolution of the conjecture that connected limit sets of finitely generated Kleinian groups are locally connected. He is also the author of a book titled Maps on Boundaries of Hyperbolic Metric Spaces. I and add that uh, Prasa Mahan also received the prestigious Infosys Award last year. Prasa Mahan. Yeah. So now it's, it's technology, and I have no say. It's stuck, so I'll start as soon as the technology gets in shape. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, I'll try to uh, begin an answer to this question, which is the topic of my talk. And uh, I'll assume that uh, everybody here knows calculus, minimal amount, but that's about it. And uh, there are two problems in mathematics which have a fairly longish history. One is, I mean, sort of, sort of uh, from the beginning of mathematics, there have been sort of two directions, one involving numbers, one involving shapes. So numbers have given rise to number theory, algebra, etc., etc. The other side has given rise to geometry, topology, some amount of analysis, and so on. So uh, both these questions occupied some of the greatest mathematical minds for any guesses, a couple of thousand years actually. So so there are two very specific problems, and uh, they were solved by two of the greats. One was Galois. The other was Gauss. And uh, Gauss solved the geometric problem, Galois solved the algebraic problem. And being a geometer, of course, my personal bias, prejudice is towards geometry, so I'll answer the geometric problem. And uh, that was this. I mean, of course, nobody knew what, a, what, what hyperbolic geometry was in Euclid's time, but the problem was posed by Euclid. Okay, so when we start off uh, doing geometry in school, at the very inception, we are introduced to uh, we are introduced to Euclidean geometry. First introduction to formal reasoning, and uh, we are given a bunch of axioms, yeah. Euclid's axioms. So there's, there's a whole whole collection of them, but this is a sort of a very short summary of the axioms of, of Euclidean axioms in two-dimensional plane Euclidean geometry. Uh, since the, the previous talk was largely a life science talk, I can't resist uh, making this uh, statement. Apparently, uh, the part of the human brain that uh, is involved in asking apparently childish or meaningless mathematical questions, which very often lead to profound things, is exactly the part of our will has a sizable overlap with the part of the brain that uh, imbibes very new information as a child. Child meaning, say, within the first two or three months. So asking these uh, meaningless questions, apparently meaningless questions, uh, is definitely uh, something that helps us acquire a lot of knowledge. And, and some of our profound quest profoundest questions come from here. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to see, I mean, so Euclid was exercising presumably that part of his brain, and uh, he posed a question, yeah? So he laid out axioms. So I'll, I'll, I'll just summarize the axioms first and then get to the question. So the first of Euclid's axioms, there are four axioms and then there's a fifth postulate. So four axioms, first one says that given any two points in the plane, you can join them by a straight line. 
So this, what, this is what we, in, in, in today's terminology, we would call a straight line segment. Yeah? Um, the second says that if you have a straight line segment, you can extend it infinitely in both directions. Yeah? So that by infinite extended object is really what we call a straight line. The first object is what we will call a straight line segment. Third axiom says that given any point on the plane in the radius, you can draw a circle. Fourth axiom says that all right angles are equal to one another. What does that mean? It means that all other angles are wrong angles. But what? Yeah. So, so I mean, what? What, what is? What exactly does that mean? I mean, so if what is a right angle? How would you define a right angle? Yeah. So you take a straight line. So already you have you have a notion of a straight line given by the first and second axioms. Uh, how would you define? So basically, you take that straight line, take an arbitrary point on it, and but so now you have a you have a canonical angle. There's an angle coming back, coming from minus infinity to that point, and then going off to plus infinity, right? Bisect that angle. That's a right angle, okay? By definition, okay? What the fourth axiom says is that that angle that you've got is independent of the line you chose and the point on it, on it that you chose, right? So that's the formal content of this. Okay. Before I come to the fifth postulate. Let's look at these four axioms a little more carefully. And what these axioms are really doing is that they are defining the players of the game. Yeah? What are the objects that we are going to play with in order to build up our geometry? The first axiom defines for you a line segment. In terms of what? In terms of, so what are the things that are sort of going there have been quietly shoved under the carpet. There's a plane and there are points on it. Yeah? So these are things that we don't define. Yeah? But with that data, we are going to define the players of our game. Given any two points, you, have, you are able to define a line segment. That's what the first axiom does for you. Yeah? So all these four axioms are in some sense defining players. Yeah? Second defines a bi-infinite line segment, yeah? uh, bi-infinite straight line. Third one defines a circle. So a circle has a center and a radius. That defines the circle completely. Yeah. And the last axiom defines the notion of an angle. Now let's come to, so the, the, these, are, these are in some sense definition axioms, first four. The fifth guy is different. It's a different status. What does it say? <coughs> it says that. You take two straight lines, assume these are straight, and now you let them fall on a particular line, and suppose that the sum of these two angles is less than 180 degrees. What that axiom says is that then these two lines, if they are extended in this direction, they are going to intersect. Yeah? This, is, this was the original formulation of the fifth postulate. Yeah? There's a crucial thing here. If these two uh, is less than 180 degrees, it's going to meet on this side. By the same axiom, if it's if it's less than 180 degrees on the other side, it's going to meet on that side. Huh? What if it's exactly equal to 180 degrees? So then we have no idea, right? So the line, the two lines don't know which side to meet, so they don't meet. That's that's not a proof, but essentially you can crank it up to a proof, and that reformulation that the lines do not meet is called, I mean that's really called the parallel postulate. So the fifth postulate is equivalent to say that through a point, so do not meet gets a special name, they're called parallel, and this is what it says. You have your you have your straight line, you have a point outside it, there's exactly one line through this point on the plane which does not meet this line. Yeah. Okay. 
basically from here you draw any line, <coughs> take this angle, make an angle such that the sum is 180 degrees, and then that line will not meet. Okay. So the fifth postulate says that through a point not on a straight line, there is one and only one straight line to the to the point parallel to the given line. This formulation of the parallel of the fifth postulate is called the parallel postulate. Maybe play fair things. Now, what was the problem that Euclid posed around 200 BC or earlier? Prove the fifth postulate from the remaining four postulates. This was his problem. If he was, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I have not read the original, but uh, I guess uh, in hindsight, the problem should have been posed as, can one prove the fifth postulate from the remaining? The, the sort of inside this question, there's a kernel of perhaps the deepest theorem of mathematical logic in the 20th century learning. Okay. So yeah, 200 BC, 20th century. See the canon. All right. So now let's uh, before we get on to the maths, let's let's yeah, it's a little bit of story time. So what's the history of the problem? Zillions of people worked on it. Finally, it was cracked by Gauss. Started thinking about par parallel lines in 1792. In 1824, he wrote to a friend, Taurinus was a friend. He writes, the assumption that the sum of three angles of a triangle is smaller than two right angles leads to a geometry which is quite different from our geometry. At that point of time, our geometry meant Euclidean geometry. But which is itself completely consistent. So the sum of the angles of a triangle, three angles of a triangle is equal to 2 pi. That's also equivalent to the parallel postulate. So basically, you look at a triangle, draw a line through here. This angle is equal to this angle. This is equal to this. So the sum of the three angles is 180 degrees. This is that. And from that, you can go back to the parallel postulate. All right. So there's a little bit of mathematical gossip, perhaps apocryphal. Gauss did not publish this work. And there's, there's sort of questions as to why he did not publish this work. And uh, there's a sort of a slightly naughty explanation given. By 1824, Gauss was an established mathematician, and he did not want to appear wrong in public. There's some reason that is given, perhaps, perhaps not. However, Gauss is not. So basically, the discovery of this uh, this geometry where the sum of angles is less than 180 degrees is not uh, in popular literature attributed to Gauss. Which is, so who are they attributed to? People who published it first. But uh, before they published, I mean, there's some other history. So you know of these hyperbolic uh, functions, hyperbolic trigonometric functions, cosine hyperbolic e power x plus e power minus x by 2. Uh, sine hyperbolic e power x minus e power minus x by 2, etc., etc. So these functions came in trying to compute areas and other uh, mensuration problems of uh, you know, before Gauss. So in the 18th century, some of these things were actually computed by Lambert. And again, then after that, the discovery was made simultaneously by two people a Hungarian mathematician by the name of Polyai, and a Russian mathematician by the name of Lobachevsky. Lobachevsky's book is completely unreadable, it's, uh, yeah, because it's got all this sort of, it's uh, apparently somebody, I think Gauss really went through that in the, basically in order to understand uh, Lobachevsky's work, it's, it's extremely computation intensive, very technical, and uh, in order to understand what he is trying to say in 500 pages, you have to read all 500 pages. <laughs> so there's no way you can sort of get the crucial idea. I mean, if you, I mean, people who do maths research sort of, well, okay, let's let's get the main idea, then we'll try to work out the details. You can't do that. Yeah, you have to go through every tree individually in order to understand the parts. That's the sort of uh, style that Kovacic adopted. Um, as good or as bad as any other, I guess. Anyway, 
So he published his paper on the principles of geometry in 1829-30, and a couple of years later, Absolute Science of Space was published by Bollier, which is much more intuitive. Anyway, at this point of time, what were they trying to do? They were trying to form formulate a geometry in which the fifth postulate would be violated. Which means what? Which means that, okay, reformulation of the parallel postulate, sum of the angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. So they were replacing it by the axiom that the sum of the angles of a triangle is strictly less than 180 degrees. <coughs> in a triangle. Yeah. That's what they were doing. And then they were trying to build up a geometry. <coughs> So less than 180 degrees has nothing to do with hyperbola. So the term hyperbolic geometry came much later, when hyperbolic geometry was really put into a certain context. And uh, I mean, in again, in hindsight, it's a wonder that it was not discovered earlier, because almost all geometries, in a certain fairly precise sense, are actually hyperbolic. This Euclidean geometry is some uh, exceptional thing, yeah? And it is only this sort of perverse habit that we have grown into that tells us to think that this Euclidean geometry is the natural thing and hyperbolic geometry is not. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to, uh, yeah, I'll try to justify that so that it's not just a sales pitch, but it's mathematically accurate. Okay. So it was uh, formulated by, I mean, the word was coined by Felix Klein, but the person who really brought it into mainstream mathematics and uh, tied it up with zillions of other areas is Poincaré. Around, uh, yeah, this, just after Klein, Klein had an ongoing competition, one side, on his side only, he was always doing it, uh, with Poincaré. And, uh, <coughs> But uh, anyway, so uh, I mean, so, so uh, yeah, I think what happened was that he was trying to find out, discover certain groups. Poincare found them out and uh, he called them Fuchsian groups. Clyde was very annoyed. He said, Fuchs had nothing to do with it, which is perfectly true. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, but I, so then I think uh, Poincare went up one more dimension. These are two dimensional objects. He went up one more dimension, discovered some groups in three dimensions. He said, okay, I'll call them Kleinian. So, so Klein had nothing to do with Kleinian groups. Hooks had nothing to do with Hooksian groups. Poincaré had everything to do with both. <laughs> so anyway, so the, this, this tying up various things, I mean, things which are even today, I mean, applicable in number theory, things called modular forms. All of it, I mean, has uh, has origins there. Yeah. In this, in this. Certainly geometry, certainly topology, but also things which look far like number theory. All right, so now let's get back to the mathematics from the gossip, and uh, let's uh, restate the parallel postulate in, in terms which are more precise. So let's, what is the parallel postulate? It says that given a straight line, L, name them now, but crucially we define the context in a plane P, in a flat Euclidean plane P. See, if you define two straight lines as parallel if they don't meet, then in three-dimensional space, you have infinitely many lines, right? So you have one line running on this uh, flat on the floor. You take this point uh, on the top, you take a straight line, and you just rotate it in a plane parallel to that line. So you're going to get infinitely many lines, right? So you're talking about two-dimensional flat plane Euclidean geometry. So that has to be said in a plane P. And a point x on P outside L, there exists a unique L prime lying on P passing through x and not meeting L, okay, which we call parallelism. And now the now Euclid's problem becomes, prove the parallel postulate from other axioms of Euclidean geometry. Good. The thing is, look, I mean, this is how a lot of mathematics is really done. There's a problem that is posed, and there is an unstated assumption, which is obvious to everybody, but we don't spell it out. So Euclidean geometry was being, I mean, the problem was being posed in the context of Euclidean geometry, which means what? All of it is being done in a plane P. Yeah, yeah everybody knows that. You spell it out. Yeah. And then 
you really start understanding, once you spelt it out, you understand that really this unstated assumption is the only place where you can attack the problem. So if you've not stated it out, if you've not exposed the vulnerable part of the problem, there is no point of attack. And so what the reason it took 2,000 years is that a large part of the time went in trying to understand what is the point of attack. There were sort of several things, uh, apparently, apparently this uh, poet, Omar Khayyam, he attempted this problem for a long time. In astronomical mathematics, he attempted this problem, bunch of others. Yeah, it's sort of a who's who. You go through the history of this problem, it's, yeah, like uh, Jacobi, I've forgotten the list, and there's a very impressive list of mathematicians who attempted this problem, I think. Okay, so, so basically, once you stated the assumption, stated the unstated, I mean, the, the common assumption, the basic question that we need to ask now is what is the context of the problem? So that means the problem is deep. This unstated assumption, which is really at the background of this entire problem, is the place where you need to attack it. So the question is, what is a pin? That which was undefined, so points on it, etc., etc. We don't know what it is. It's some axiomatic thing. It's a piece of paper. That's not a definition. So what is a pin? That was the question. We don't know the context. I mean, basically, the question was asked because there was a common shared context, but it was not formally clear. It was not something you could manipulate. You could manipulate the flares. You could manipulate lines, angles, circles, etc., etc., etc. But you were not allowed to manipulate the under underlying structure, which is the pain peak. So, what exactly are, is the pain peak? Can we understand it in some more fundamental terms so that we can manipulate? That was the question. I mean, that's one of the main reasons why this problem took such a long time. And the answer to this question is actually comes from a very different area of mathematics. That's why it's it took a long time. And once we have defined that plane P, just note that in the Euclid axioms you have this line segment, and then the straight line is defined in terms of that, angle is defined in terms of that, right? So what we would like to do ideally is Start off with a notion of a plane P. From that, derive the notion of a straight line. So, a straight line now becomes an emergent mathematical object. Yeah, not something intrinsic, not something defined, yeah? but something that emerges from the definition of a plane P as an object which has some characteristic properties. Yeah? So, that is our goal. That is the goal of these three questions. And then, notion of parallelism. Once you have a notion of straight line, the notion of parallelism is clear. Two straight lines are parallel and they do not meet. It's just a word. Yeah. So basically what we'd like is a, an a priori definition of a plane, and then from that, define what, what straight lines are. OK, good. So the answer for Euclidean geometry is R2 equipped with a certain metric. Metric means the way of measuring distances. What is that? It's ds squared equal to dx squared plus dy squared. What is this? This is just an infinitesimal way of saying what the Pythagoras theorem is. a squared plus b squared equal to c squared. Yeah. But if if a is very small and b is very small and you want to sum, want to do this is the only place where I'll need calculus. So so basically, what so there's this there's this infinitesimal way of using the Pythagoras theorem. And it's packaged in this one neat formula. What's the meaning of this formula? There's something infinitesimally small. It's square equal to sum of two other infinitesimal squares apart from some vague philosophical content. How, how are we going to translate that into maths? Yeah. So the, I mean, if you open that package, and that's a formula, it's a package, yeah. What does it signify? It means that if you have a smooth curve, on a plane, yeah, R2, then the length of that curve can be calculated. And this is where integral calculus or differential calculus comes in. Calculus comes in. This is computed by the standard formula that we know from high school that integral of ds is, well, you parameterize your curve x of t, y of t, take the derivative x prime t, y prime t, and then you look at x prime t square plus y prime t square. So basically, at every point, you're looking at the two derivatives. 
you apply Pythagoras, that is giving rise to a certain length of a length of a tangent vector at that point. And then you are multiplying it by <laughs> dt. So that's the infinitesimal amount that you are traveling along the curve. Then you sum over t. So basically behind all this there is a fairly sophisticated amount of thinking that has gone on. Calculus came 1500 years or yeah, 1580. So maybe basically 17 plus. Yeah. So yeah, maybe some 1700 years already of that 2000 years has been captured. Yeah. So basically, in order to manipulate the plane, we want something, some more fundamental structure. Yeah. So this structure came with Newton with Leibniz much later, 1400 something or the other, and. Uh, this is a fundamental advance. I mean, we, we start doing our calculus in maybe class 11 or so, but we don't realize that today it's become part and parcel of our, I mean, of our toolkit. <coughs> but uh, it was not there before that. So people were not able to solve this uh, Euclidean geometry problem. Yeah. Before that, basically, <coughs> because there was no, I mean, there was no, fun, no more fundamental model. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, how many people are familiar with this thing, that, with this formula A on the board? Very good, enough. Okay, so that means I can carry on with that. Good. So, uh, so yeah, so, so this is the length of this curve, and then what, I mean, what is what's going on behind this is that you use some parameterization of the curve. Now, if you are given this formula for, uh, I mean, if you just define a Euclidean plane this way, do straight lines have a certain property, have a certain special property? Yes? Students? Yeah? With respect to this distance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes, yes? <coughs> Come up with whatever answers you know. I mean, you took a, yeah, go ahead. So the ratio of dy and dx Ratio of dy and dx is constant. Okay, but I have told you just this one formula, ds square. Where is dy dx? Yeah. yeah. The length of path is variable. The length of path is variable. Very good. So in terms of this, this L of sigma, the, the straight line is the unique kind which minimizes distances between points. Yeah. All right. Where length is some object calculated according to this formula. Fine. So now we have, once you have this formula, yeah, once you have a way of computing lengths, shortest lengths are exactly what define straight lines. So now the straight line has become an emergent object, right? It is defined in terms of this metric, in terms of the plane with the metric. Yeah. It's no longer an a priori thing, which you have to introduce as an axiom. Good. Let's proceed. So the straight line is the shortest distance as per the previous formula between them. And parallelism now is just as before. Two by infinite straight lines are parallel if they don't peak. Good. So now the whole thing boils down to what is a plane P. Now if you have a plane P with that formula, yeah, you can prove that two parallel lines, I mean that, that, there, is a, that there is one and only one line parallel to the first one. So if you take, so what does it mean? If you take your definition of a plane which was not stated in Euclid's axiom, to be R2 equipped with that metric, then the parallel postulate does hold, right? Which means in order to address the question, can you prove the fifth postulate from the remaining four axioms, what will you have to do? This is basically trying to expose the point where you can attack the problem. It means you have to go back to that formula, ds square equal to dx square plus dy square, and modify that. With that formula, the fifth postulate will have to hold. Right? So if you want to have a hope of saying that, no, the, you, you want, what you want to do, you want to change that formula see that the first four axioms are satisfied and the fifth axiom is violated. But, and if you want to prove it from those, then what you'll have to do is, 
that for all possible formulae that you put in here, the that satisfy the first four axioms, the fifth axiom is also satisfied. So now the point of attack is well defined. So we'll have to manipulate this one simple looking formula. So this is the question. So we'll have to, so basically, I mean, this is really okay. So hindsight is 2020. I mean, the person who really brought in this perspective was uh, somebody who, in whose uh, second thesis examination called the Hamlet Assignment uh, Shift. Gauss was the examiner. <laughs> Bernard Riemann. <laughs> so that's that's how this. This, yeah. Mm. yeah, I have stories to say about that maybe if we have time later. Okay, so let's try to modify that formula. So how, how do we want modify it? Take some subset of R2 and now instead of, so basically, okay, so the other thing to notice is that we wrote dx square plus dy square. Again, there was something that was unstated. The coefficient of that dx square is 1. Yeah, we did not write 1. Oh, everybody understands this one, right? So because everybody understands, nobody writes it. <laughs> and one not treated as a constant, but one treated as a constant function over all of R2. So basically, understanding what is unstated in the problem is what proving this problem is about. Yeah? So what do you do? You replace, that's, that's where you can hit the problem. So you replace one as a function over all of R2 by arbitrary functions now. Say f of xy plus g of xy. So now what is what is the general geometry? ds square equal to f of xy dx square plus g of xy dy square. What where what is happening? F and g are positive. And the length is computed according to the formula. You again parameterize x of t, y of t, x prime t square plus y prime t square type earlier it was one, one. Now you replace the first one by f, the second one by g. Okay, and now you again have have a this is your your generalization of that previous formula. <laughs> now the problem from having absolutely nowhere to attack now become is given you a huge amount of choice. All positive smooth functions f, all positive smooth functions g. How are you going to try it out for all f and all g? So there are sort of two way, I mean two basic things that go on in mathematics. One is you want to take a problem and work very hard once you know that there is a and, and find some way, point of attack. That's what this discovery of this theory of calculus gave us. Once that calculus was discovered, now there's some huge amount of choice. Now you want to find one particular metric and test it out for them. But now it's like hunting for a needle in a haystack with cardinality 2 power c, right? So, I mean, the, this what is the collect? I mean, the cardinality of the collection of fun functions. That's some huge thing. Real line has has uh, cardinality c, right? And you want to choose one metric out of these. Yeah. So now there's uh, now from it's basically really a rags to riches story. There, there was no technique available prior to calculus. Now. You have so many metrics available, you don't know which one to choose. So the motivation to choose, so, where is, so one, so there are two. So the second thing, the second step, I mean, this is the, the, the previous thing only accounted for some 1700 years or maybe something like that. The next thing, choosing the right metric has to come from, again, some kind of motivation. Yeah? You have to have some clue, some intuition that, okay, if you look in this direction, maybe you're going to get a metric which is going to give you something, some new interesting kind of geometry. And then you'll have to play, exercise that part of your brain. So, okay, so, okay, well, well, before we get into that, so the notion of a straight line in this metric is replaced by a notion of a, of a geodesic. So it's a, it's a path which, which minimizes the distances, but according to this revised formula. And all our congruences that we studied in high school, Angle, angle, side, side, SSS, side, angle, side, etc., etc. All of those are examples of what are called isometries. So, what's an isometry in this in this uh, context? It's something that preserves that infinitesimal form of the formula. It preserves. Therefore, if it if you if you preserve distances in the infinitesimal level, then you integrate out something, then your the lengths of paths will be the same, right? 
So an isometry is something that preserves the infinitesimal form, hence preserves all lengths, hence preserves minimum length. Yeah? Hence preserves the distance that we started off from in Euclidean time. Good. So we have these two notions. So what are these? An isometry is a map which, which means that you take x, y going to s, x1, y1 under under this map i, infinitesimal thing for uh, uh, satisfied means you take f of x, y, dx square plus g, x, y, dy square, that was the first ds square, and after you've transformed it's x1, y1, dx1 square plus x1, y1, g of x1, y1, dy1 square. These two infinitesimal lengths must be the same. So an isometry, if you now you just set it down into a formula which need not have any other interpretation except calculus. That's something that you can manipulate. So this is what an isometry is. But now, so the, the first part of the talk, I think we have been able to say that okay, why 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 was I mean, why were mathematicians stuck? Because the money geometry was not there. But then we'll have to choose, we'll have to choose a particular f particular g. Yeah. Simplifying assumption, at least choose f equal to g. Mathematicians always try to find, find first a simple thing. If it works, then why should we complicate our lives unnecessarily? So choose f equal to g, for instance, okay, even then, even once you realize there's, there's one fun function f, smooth positive function, there's so many other. So how are we going to choose it? That choice was guided by something else in a completely different part of mathematics. This is what was that Poincare Klein story was about. And uh, that's the exposition that I'll be taking. You choose the Euclidean plane, but not all of it. You choose the upper half plane, yeah? y greater than 0. And equip it with a certain metric, where you take the Euclidean metric and scale it by 1 by y square. Yeah? So f of xy equal to g of xy equal to 1 by y square. And you're taking y greater than 0. Why have I made this particular choice? Well, the short answer is because Poincaré tells us to do it. But uh, he, why, why did, so the question is, why did Poincaré come up with this formula? That's a completely different story. Comes from a different part of mathematics, which will define, I mean, it will be, could be the topic of a completely different talk. So I'll, I won't tell you. I'll, so there is a little bit of a rabbit out of a hat here. So from this uncountable collection, we picked out one minute. So once you have, you are given, now let's try to compute what the straight lines are in this geometry. Yeah? And then we'll ask, we'll, we'll find out whether the first four axioms of Euclid are satisfied in this geometry and whether the fifth postulate is also satisfied or not. And then we'll have an answer to Euclid's question. Okay. So the first thing is, now you have this one simple formula to manipulate with. First theorem says that vertical straight lines. So what is the space you're looking at? <coughs> the space you're looking at is x, y. So this is y axis, <coughs> the x axis. <coughs> H is the upper half plane. Yeah? That's called the hyperbolic plane for a certain reason. And now you're computing. So you want to prove that any vertical line, vertical line is a geodesic, which means what? Which means you take any two points here. So that's uh, x0, y1, and x0, y2. And you take any path between them. Yeah? You want to show that this, the length of this path calculated according to this new formula <coughs> is less than or equal to the length of any other path, sigma. So you parameterize sigma as <coughs> sigma of t is x of t, y of t. Okay? So what is L of sigma? So sigma of 0 is equal to x0, y1. Sigma of 1 is equal to x0, y2. What is L of sigma? This is equal to x prime t square, so f of x y, g of x y, both is 1 by y, right? So 1 by y of t square, x prime 
e square plus y prime e square. And then you want to, this was this is equal to ds square. So you want to integrate from 0 to 1 the square root of this whole thing, times e, right? In Euclidean case, you would have just taken this, but now you have to divide out by this. Now, this guy is always positive, so this is always going to be greater than or equal to reduce x prime t to 0. So what does that become? This is integral 0 to 1 y prime t by y of t dt. What's that? That's log of y of t integrated from 0 to 1. So this is log of mod y2 by y1. But what is this? x prime t with equality if and only if x prime t is identically 0, right? So anything where there is a, where x prime t has no, a non zero value somewhere will have length greater. But what does x, x, x prime t uh, identically equal to 0 mean? It means that the x coordinate is constant. That means what is the vertical line, right? So therefore, what have we established? We have established that the vertical line from here to here is a geodesic, a distance minimizing path. Not only that, it is the distance minimizing path because any other path has greater length. So there is a unique guy joining a pair of points which minimizes distances. So first axiom of Euclid satisfied, <coughs> or at least for pairs of points which are above each other. Right? Okay, good. Now from this collection of geodesics, we want to collect uh, compute new geodesics, right? We want to join any two points. So the two points which don't lie on the same vertical cannot be joined by a vertical line, right? So we would still like to join them by geodesics. So what is the geodesic joining two other two points? To do that, we'd like to get new isometries. So what are examples of isometries? One simple exercise that you can do is you look at f of x, y equal to x plus a comma y. So then, you look at d of this one, this is x1 is equal to x plus a. So dx1 is equal to dx. So that shows you that the ds square and ds1 square are both equal. Right? So these guys are, 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 are these translations in the horizontal direction, they are isometries. So if you had proven this whole thing for a particular vertical, the y axis for instance, and you translate it around, you're going to get all vertical lines, all of them are going to be genesis. Good. Now we come to another, the other. so this was one computation. Now I'll get to the second computation in this talk. And this is actually something that came from Perma, spherical uh, optics, geometric optics. So here's the fact that you look at, again, you have your hyperbolic plane and this is your y-axis, this is your x-axis, and you look at, say, the same <coughs> circle centered at 0, 0, radius 1, yeah? And look at the inversion, the spherical inversion. Assume this is a mirror, and you invert in that mirror, yeah? So, there's the thing. Oh, why am I getting this in my So, what is spherical inversion? There's a picture way of looking at it. Suppose this distance is capital R, then this is 1 by R, and this theta is the same. This is exactly what you get pictorially if you invert in a spherical mirror of radius 1. The, the theta coordinate remains the same, the radial coordinate becomes reciprocal, 1 by R. So, here's the, so that's the next claim. Inversions about semicircles. So basically you can do this about a, a circle of radius capital R. But for simplicity of computation, we do it for radius 1. So there's a way, there's a nice way, a formula for writing this in terms of complex coordinates. So write z equal to x plus i times y. So this is x and this is the imaginary axis. And what happens is that you are sending, so this, this guy, so, uh, 
Yeah, so you, you so the, the right coordinate for this is the spherical coordinates, so the, or the circular coordinates, yeah. polar coordinates. And for that, the complex numbers are better suited. But this is just a computational tool, nothing more. So this inversion is an isometry, that is the clay. What was our formula? ds square equal to dx square plus dy square by y square. Yeah? And then the complex conjugate this becomes x minus i1. So can you write this in complex coordinates? Indeed, yes. So this is dx plus i dy, dx minus i dy. What is that? dz times dz bar. And what is y? y is z minus z bar by twice i. So y is so x plus i y minus x plus i y, which is 2 i y divided by 2 i y. <coughs> <laughs> so you've now expressed this all this in this terms. And what is this inversion in, in this setup? It's become very simple. So that is our f. Z goes to 1 by z bar. R squared by z bar if, if the radius of the circle was r. But there's a certain constant which I keep messing up every time I do this computation. So I'll choose capital R equal to 1. OK. So if z goes to 1 by z bar, what does dz go to? This goes to minus 1 by z bar square dz bar. What does z bar go to? It goes to 1 by z. So dz bar goes to minus 1 by z square dz. Now you plug it all back. So dz, dz bar by z minus z bar by 2i whole square. This was the ds square on the left side. What does it transform to? Minus 1 by z square dz bar times minus 1 by z square dz divided by 1 by z bar minus 1 by z divided by 2 pi whole square, which is the same thing as this is z z bar of the, you know, this is z minus z bar. That's what it becomes. This is a multiplication. So what happens? I'll, this is minus. This is minus. This gets cancelled. The z square, z bar square cancels off with this z bar and this z. So this is equal to dz dz bar by z minus z bar by 2i whole square. Which means the formula is preserved under this inversion. Yeah. Good. So that means inversions about semicircles centered at the origin, if you put R squared, this is the same computation works out. These guys are isometries. Yeah. But we know that translations in this direction are isometries. You can compose all of this. So actually, you can shift this origin. Yeah. Again, I mean, fixing an origin is something that we attribute to the plane. The plane itself does not care which fellow is there. The plane is much more democratic than us. Okay. So it has its origin could be shifted anywhere on the real life. Yeah. So this translation is, is what tells you that uh, that all these points are interchangeable. Yeah. So really, it's not uh, this is a formula because you set up these coordinates. Yeah. There's a difference between affine Euclidean geometry and coordinate geometry. Coordinates are something we put yeah, in order to get maps to do computations. Yeah. But the isometry is basically is a way of looking at it intrinsically from the point of view of the plane itself. So inversions about semicircles centered anywhere along the real line, because those are things that you can get by translating by isometries, are going to be isometries, right? <coughs> Using that, now we want to get, so the last thing is that we want to get new geodesics. We know that vertical line is a geodesic. Image of a geodesic under an isometry is another geodesic, right? What have we got? We've got these vertical lines as geodesics. We've got these inversions about semicircles as isometries. So images of vertical lines under inversions about semicircles centered on the real line are going to give us new geodesics. That's the last thing that we want to do. And there's no computation, but a simple Euclidean geometry problem. This is our picture. Okay. So if you 